gives me great pleasure to introduce one of the men of the moment, the man of the moment, Omar Barada, who is curator of this year's uh, Abraj Group Art Prize. And if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, please do do so. It's essential viewing. But Omar has had many moments at Art Dubai, particularly through the Global Art Forum, where he was director in 2014, co-director, and has participated many times since. Omar is also obviously a writer, translator, curator, and director of Dar al Mamun as well in Marrakesh. So when we started thinking about our topic of trade, we were naturally drawn to the seas and the ports, and you'll hear more about that from Lale. We were drawn to the skies and to airports, and you'll hear about that later with Paul Griffiths. But when we talked to Omar about sites of trade, he immediately said, what about the deserts? Deserts were, of course, not, active, not passive places, but active places, places of journeys, of exchange, and of trade. And we also then led uh, to a discussion with Shimon about what happens when places are no longer places of trade. What do they become then? So, Omar, over to you. Thank you to uh, Antonia and Shimon, Oscar, for inviting me back home. <laughs> um, I should know. I should know the rules better. I um, was supposed to have, you know, paper to read from, but of course I wasn't able to go up there to print because it's Ladies' Day, and they wouldn't let me in. <laughs> so I'll try and read from the computer. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, this is actually going to be a bit tentative. It's the uh, beginning of a project that I was kind of considering when uh, Antonia spoke to me about the theme of this year. I didn't realize then when I said, yeah, let's do something about the desert, that it was a very huge topic. Um, <laughs> and so what should be happening now? I'll have some images for you that I think I can control with this. And we'll also have on the screens here, uh, starting about now, uh, a film from 1966 that's very rare. Few people have seen it uh, by um, a Moroccan writer and director I've been working on uh, and on his archive named Ahmed Bouanani. It's called Tarfaya ou la marche d'un poète. Tarfaya or the, I guess, the walk of a poet. Um, it will play silently and it's just, um, it's, it was shot in the desert uh, south of Morocco in 1966. <coughs> And just for the translators, because I think there's a translation booth, I will read a couple of things in Arabic, which I will also read in English afterwards. So when I read in Arabic, uh, you don't need to translate. وَمِنْ سِجِلْ مَاسَ إِلَىٰ أَوْدَغُسْتْ شَهْرَانِ عَلَىٰ سِمَةِ الْمَغْرِبِ فَتَقَعُوا مُنْحَرِفَةً مُحَادَاتًا عَلَىٰ السُوسِ الْأَقْصَىٰ كأنها مع سجل ماسا مثلث طويل الساقين أقصر أضلاعه من السوس إلى أودغست وأودغست مدينة لطيفة أشبه بلاد الله بمكة وبمدينة الجرزوان في بلد الجرزجان من بلد خرسان لأنها بين جبلين ذات شعاب ومن أودغست إلى غانا بضعة عشر يوما بالمفردة ومن غانا إلى كوغا نحو شهر ومن كوغا إلى ساما دون الشهر ومن ساما إلى كزم نحو الشهر أيضا ومن كزم إلى كوكو شهر ومن كوكو إلى مرندا شهر ومن مرندا إلى زويلا شهران ومن زويلا إلى إجدابية شهر ومن زويلا إلى فزان خمس عشرة مرحلة ومن فزان إلى زغاوة شهران From Sijil Masa to Audarust is two months' journey in a westerly direction. Audarust is situated obliquely opposite to the farthest Sous, Sous al-Aqsa, as though Audarust and the Sous formed with Sijil Masa a triangle with two long legs, its shortest side being from the Sous to Audarust. Audarust is a pleasant town, and of all God's lands, it most resembles Mecca and the town of Jurzuan in the district of Juzjan in Khorasan, because it is situated between two mountains intersected by ravines. From Audarus to, Ga to Ghana takes 10 odd days for a light caravan. From Ghana to Kura takes about a month. 
from Kura to Sama, less than a month, from Sama to Kuzum, also about a month, from Kuzum to Kauko, a month, and from Koko to Maranda, a month, from Maranda to Zawila, two months, from Zawila to Ajdabiya, one month, from Zawila to the Fazan is 15 stages, from the Fazan to Zarawa, two months. This is a part of a, a, a text on the Maghrib, on, on the Maghrib region, in a book by Ibn Hawqal, an Egyptian geographer from the 10th century. And the book is called the Kitab Surat Al-Ard, the image of the earth. Um, so nowadays, the modes of transportation and durations of transport have changed. Um, but some things, uh, bizarrely, perhaps haven't. The, this image I wanted to show you is, by, uh, is a drawing by a Moroccan artist. It's from two, 2009. His name is Mohamed Fateka. It's called Africa as they like it. And it's accompanied by a text. When I was young, there was a gas station next to our house. From time to time, especially during holidays, my father would bring food to the station workers. One of the employees wore a shirt with the inscription Africa, illustrated by a map. One day, I asked my dad, what is Africa? He told me that it was the continent where Morocco lies. I didn't understand the term continent. I only knew the map of Morocco. No one ever spoke to me about Africa, and his response remained totally incomprehensible to me. So, um, a few years later, today, a lot of people in Morocco speak about Africa. Um, on the one hand, Morocco is embracing the continent as a major new site of economic investment and political influence, and one example is um, the Royal Air Morocco, the Moroccan National Airline Company, which maybe about 20 years ago was, had only very few destinations to Africa through two routes, and now has more than 30. This, this, even today, a couple of years after this map, there's many more. Um, and uh, being somebody who flies into and out of Morocco a lot in the, um, the last few years, of course, uh, Royal Morocco has, um, has uh, kind of organized the Casablanca airport to become a hub uh, towards sub-Saharan Africa. So if you take any flight from Europe to Casablanca, um, half of the people on the flight are people going to Ivory Coast, going to Benin, going to Senegal, etc. And what I've started noticing, and I should say I don't live in Morocco, I go often, but I don't live there. Uh, I grew up there. Um, is that uh, the first times when, the, when the, the network started expanding and more and more, uh, to say, I mean, more and more black people were on these airplanes, uh, what I would notice is a kind of, um, um, you know, um, uh, how would I say that, awkwardness of my compatriots as to seating arrangements and next to who you're going to sit and overhearing things like, uh, uh, are you going to sit there? And, and overhearing that um, they were referring uh, to uh, these people that they thought were different from them as the Africans, al-Afariqa. That's how, how, when I started getting interested in this and uh, thinking of Si Muhammad Fattaka's, uh, you know, headless drawing of the continent, is if we're referring to people from south of the Sahara as the Africans, who are we? The other thing I should mention is that the European Union having effectively subcontracted control of its borders to the countries north of the, in North Africa, uh, you have a lot of people from sub-Saharan countries trying to cross over, not being able to, and ending up staying and living in, in Morocco and other countries in the north. And uh, they are faced with a lot of discrimination, uh, insults, physical violence, um, etc. Uh, Doctors Without Borders did a report on this in 2013, after which they decided not to even work in Morocco anymore on this question. Um, I now live in New York, and recently I was in a shoe store buying shoes, and the person who was selling me the shoes said, is Morocco in Africa? I thought it was in the Middle East. I, I had never thought of it 
in quite those terms, but they seemed rather apt at capturing this uh, reality I'm trying to speak about. Um, In starting in the 40s, when the nationalist movement uh, was getting organized to struggle against French colonization of Morocco, um, it, it organized itself around a kind of unified front, and the unified front was a kind of Arab Muslim front, um, and which seemed to be an, an efficient way of doing this and gaining independence. It, um, the thing is that did away with all the other components of Moroccan identity, and um, to this day, um, and the other components being Berber, African, etc. So Moroccans have been taught in school and elsewhere to think of themselves as, as Arabs, exclusively Arabs and Muslims. And this is not just you know, uh, people who haven't thought about it or haven't had an opportunity to talk about it. Um, I like to quote from this interview um, from 1991 with uh, Tahar Ben Jeloun, who's a very well-known Moroccan writer. He had just received a very prestigious French literary prize then. He was interviewed by an American academic whose first question was, as a Moroccan, do you identify yourself as African? Do you view Morocco as African? And the answer was no. In Morocco, one tends to feel more Arab than African. We're really in the no northernmost part of Africa, and we have a very different history. Personally, I don't feel at all African. That's not a pejorative or mean statement, but I don't feel African because I have no ties to Africa. Uh, Ibn Hawqal, the author I was um, mentioning earlier, has a little passage that says, the southern part of the earth includes the land of the Sudan. And Sudan in classical Arabic writing was the, the land, the Sudan are the blacks, the land of the blacks. So it's the whole territory south of the Sahara from west to east. So the southern part of the earth includes the land of the Sudan. Their land, which is the furthest west on the ocean, is an encircled land, which has no contact with other kingdoms. No ties to Africa. So Africa is the other. It's some kind of terra incognita. And from the point of view of Arab identity, it appears as a site of disidentification, perennially other. So this is paradoxical from the point of view of the theme of the Global Art Forum this year because we know for a fact that between, at least between the 8th and the 16th centuries, and actually more than that, right through the 19th century, there was intense communication, circulation along several different trans-Saharan routes. I had a map, this one. Uh, that traversed the Sahara Desert, a territory 2,000 kilometers wide and 5,000 kilometers long between the Atlantic Ocean and the Red Sea. And this circulation involved goods, commerce, trade, but also knowledge and books, and also people, slaves in particular, not only. In the 14th century, Ibn Khaldun, for instance, wrote, it is more profitable and more advantageous for the trader to export his products to a distant land and take a dangerous route. In this way, the distance and the risk incurred will give a rare quality to his merchandise and thereby increase its value. This is why the wealthiest and most prosperous merchants are those who dare to go to the Sudan. Another author, Ibn al-Faqih, eleventh century, writes, from Tarqala to the town of Ghana is a three-month journey through deserts. In the country of Ghana, gold grows in the sand as carrots do and is plucked at sunrise. The food of the people there consists of sorghum, which they call duchen, millet, and of cowpeas. Their clothes are made of panther skins, panthers being abundant there. I think I should go a little faster, so I'll, I, unfortunately I'll have to skip some amazing quotes. Um, the, the, so to, to sum up this part, the, the main things that were traded back and forth were basically gold for salt. Uh, gold growing like carrots south of the Sahara was um, uh, uh, you know, sold to the northerners who um, sold salt. 
uh, to the southerners because they didn't have any in salt and they didn't have fridges. They needed salt to conserve their food. So salt was extremely precious and extremely rare south of the Sahara. Um, Let's go to this. Um, this is Mansa Musa, there with a gold coin. He, this is the 14th century. He was the king of what is now Mali. Uh, he, and this is uh, what is known as the Catalan Atlas. It's from 1375. Uh, so he, his fame went all the way to Europe. And one of the, the best known anecdotes about him is that he went on a pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, and that his entourage during that trip included 60,000 followers, 80 camels, and 500 slaves. This was in 1324, 25. And that he dumped so much gold on Cairo in 1325 that he created an inflation and economic crisis that the place had a really hard time um, <laughs> getting out of. Um, the reason I'm mentioning him is that if he went on a pilgrimage and there were many like him, uh, that means he was a Muslim. And we know that through the, the trade, uh, conversion started. And the, the first people to convert were the traders. Um, uh, probably it helped with trading with Muslims to convert to Islam. And then the, ru the rulers followed suit. And, uh, and then the people, though it's hard to know how um, sincere or hypocritical were those the terms earlier, <laughs> was the conversion of the people. Uh, in any case, as trade intensified, the Sahara started getting peopled. Towns were being built on the northern edge and the southern edges um, that were nodes of the, of the Trans-Saharan routes. Settlements were established around oases in the desert as stops along the route. Um, most Saharan oases were built between the 8th and the 16th centuries. And during that period, the desert was a rather peopled place. I remember hearing Suleiman Bashir Diagna on a panel one day saying that in the Sahara, people were actually walking on each other's toes, contrary to what you think. In any case, there were times during which the desert looked more like a bridge than like a forbidding barrier, as we imagine it now. In it, North African and Sub-Saharan cultures met and created new forms of life in the Sahara. The Sahara Desert became very much like a third space or a space of cultural translation. Of course, this was not devoid of violence. There were wars, there was slave trade, trans-Saharan slave trade, that uh, economies of uh, uh, um, places in North Africa and in the Middle East were um, based upon or thriving upon. Through this conjunction, there was also a circulation of manuscripts. Um, there were study trips, there were pilgrimages. Uh, you find um, towards the and, and you find institutions of higher learning. Timbuktu is a very famous place with San Kore as a university. There was also Jenne and other cities. And the learning in those institutions was usually done in Arabic. Towards the beginning of French colonization of the continent, the governor of Senegal, Baron Roger, wrote that there were in Senegal more Negroes, I quote, who could read and write in Arabic in 1828 than French peasants who could read and write French. When he visited Timbuktu in the 16th century, Leo Africanus wrote that many book manuscripts coming from Berber lands were sold and more profits were realized on this sale than any other merchandise. Um, Usman Khan, a, a scholar teaching at Harvard, says that the Arabic language, as the language of Islamic learning and liturgy, was the glue holding together large populations of the Maghreb, the Sahara, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And maybe some of you know this term that was coined by um, Ali Mazrui, a Kenyan, a Kenyan uh, scholar, uh, Afrabia, to refer uh, to this and to the existence of an African archive that's maybe different from the colonial archive and maybe also inaccessible to what some call Europhone intellectuals. So back to today, because I think I have to um, conclude. 
from the point of view of current racism against sub-Saharan refugees and disidentification with the continent, it is as though what I just told you about was some kind of retrospective science fiction narrative. Um, it is as though today we're back to day one when Ibn Hawqal was kind of counting the months to reach that very far away destination and that place that's encircled and cut away with no ties to the rest of the world. The question is what happened? I don't have a, obviously a clear or definitive answer, uh, but there are several uh, possible explanations. There are geopolitical reasons, and maybe what Lale will uh, talk about uh, have, has ties to it. From the 16th century, the trans-Saharan trade slowly receded due to Europe's um, beginning of a conquest of the, of the, of the port cities around uh, the Atlantic coast of Africa, the, the rising prominence of Europe as a naval power, especially the Portuguese and the Spaniards, uh, their imperial conquests in the Americas, which ended up having a lot more gold than <laughs> Mansa Musa and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, those other guys. Um, and also, and then, so that was the 16th century and even further towards the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th with actual colonization of most of the continent, uh, Europe uh, preferred to do trade uh, in, in a maritime fashion and intra-African relations basically became replaced by relations of each African place with its colonizer. There are also, I suppose, psychosocial reasons. There were very good reasons in a place like Morocco to forget or to repress certain cultural facts when slavery became a little less fashionable. Uh, I grew up there, I had no idea we had slaves uh, not so long ago. Um, and of course, colonial reasons, um, the, the, as it were, the planting of Europhone memory on African bodies. Um, the, the way colonization has functioned, especially in the French case, is to classify, compartmentalize, and segregate people. The French had something they called white Africa, something they called black Africa. They had something they called Arabs and something they called Berbers, or oral culture, written culture, etc. And the people of North Africa or of Morocco internalized those classifications. Um, I, I, I don't know if I have time to do this, but I just wanted to end on um, some stories of return. So, th so this is a story basically of uh, the disappearance of the memory of trans-Saharan trade and communications. And I've been kind of hunting for traces of it that, that remain. Uh, one of the traces is in music, Gnawa music of Morocco, which is a music um, that is made, that's supposed to be made by descendants of former slaves. What's interesting to me about this music, oh, this is, this was Timbuktu, is, um, I don't know if we can have it on, is, um, is that it's usually sung in Moroccan Arabic. Um, the, the, the Gnawa are, Arabized, Muslimized, uh, but they sing in Moroccan Arabic, except that if you listen closely, in a lot of the songs, you have phrases or passages or moments when the, um, the, the language is not Arabic anymore at all. It's some language that you don't recognize. And in fact, when you ask them, they don't necessarily know what they're singing, what the language is and what it means. And it's, it's kind of like some remainder that hasn't wanted to die from some former language and, and a bambara hausa or something. Um, that is still there in the form of a trace, and, and a trace that has not assimilated or, or uh, that has not disappeared in the culture. Um, and maybe we won't be able to hear it because I don't know how to do this. <laughs> with, with um, I'm supposed to click in the middle. Um, and, and, and to me, I think, what, what some scholars have been noticing is that the migrants or refugees from sub-Saharan countries that I spoke about earlier, who are coming by foot to Morocco, uh, to speak about the example of Morocco, or to Algeria, are by and large coming through those very routes that were active several centuries ago, as though there were some 
vague traces that remain, you know, I don't know in what kind of level of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of reality that are being reactivated, um, uh, that are being remapped by these new, new migrations on old routes. Uh, as though the Sahara was a palimpsest of, of crossing traces, um, and that and that there was some kind of reopening of the trans-Saharan routes under the feet of the exiles, and in that way, the return of a historical repressed in a, in, a, in a certain fashion, uh, the return of the historical ref, repressed of of slavery that is kind of dealt with with racism today. Um, and perhaps I'll spare you my conclusion <laughs> so that we have five minutes for a discussion. I think Antonia had, had planned to ask some questions. Yes, good afternoon. I wonder, is there a link between the, the Arab-speaking uh, countries in Northern Africa? Uh, is there an organization that keeps them together? Are they linked? Um, the, the, yeah, there, there are. Yeah, there is a political organization, the uh, organization of the I don't know what they call it, the le, le, le Grand Maghreb Arab, the Great Arab Maghreb. <laughs> um, it's a political organization. It's not functioning very well because there are conflicts um, between some of them. Um, uh, but but yeah, they have they have similar histories to certain degrees and certainly from the point of view of the trans-saharan roots because they they you know they are in the same i mean they they have the same coordinates in a way from that point of view do you mind if i can i ask a quick question mm. yeah i just uh, we i was discussing earlier with some uh artists that were here from senegal from dakar and remembering um, a visit there and the prevalence of Emirates Airlines everywhere. Oh, yeah. And talking to uh, colleagues there in West Africa about how the spread of kind of the Gulf Airlines, sorry to bring this back to a Gulf question, but <laughs> the, the kind of rise of Gulf Airlines, how that relationship had then affected pre uh, the, the colonial relationships that the Francophone countries there had with France and how the gaze was swiveling to the Gulf, not only because of the rise of the, the airlines and the way they were connecting different cities in Africa, but also the way in which places like Dubai uh, kind of created a point at which they could also have meetings with Chinese traders and it just kind of reconfigured the way we uh, the, the trade routes were yeah. viewed. So I just wondered if you could just touch on that in, as far as North Africa is concerned as well. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not something I know very well, but certainly um, the, the f friend, former French colonies seem to be stuck with France in some way. This, it's very difficult, even from the cultural point of view, if, if uh, in Morocco, anything that happens has some kind of partnership with a French institution or funding of some sort, etc. The the um, for for language, it's it's the same way. You know, Arabic, French, French uh, is still very very dominant. So I think there are now certainly today with newer generations uh, of um, of people and of um, investors, etc. Uh, looking for ways to get to get out of that binary of that f formerly colonial binary, which when they are in it, they can't branch out into something else. So maybe you, in that case, you need, you know, Emirates or some third territory to encourage the opening. Well, thank you so much. Any other questions? No. In that case, I think we might just take a, a quick break. So we, our next panel is led by Sultan al-Qasimi, and we're looking at the relationship between um, the Gulf and India as far as the gold trade goes. And that starts at 4.40, so 20 to 5. So if you can please be, have, grab a quick coffee and, and come back for that, that would be great. Thank you. And Omar, thank you so much. Great. Right.